Hello everyone, welcome to lecture two of the course Philosophy of Science for Psychologists. This lecture we start with the epistemology of Francis Bacon who broke with Aristotle but not mind you with the Bible so where in previous times Aristotle and the Bible were coupled Bacon decouples them and by doing so he enabled other philosophers to criticize Aristotle without criticizing the Bible and to rethink the debate between rationalism and empiricism and in this lecture we look at the rationalism of René Descartes and the empiricism of Locke, Berkeley and Hume, three British empiricists. After we've done that we'll take a look at where at that moment in history rationalism and empiricism in the debate well uh, had a standoff basically and then we'll take a look at what happened next in the epistemology debate. We start today's lecture with the introduction of the ideas of Francis Bacon. He was important because he was the one that argued that we should no longer listen to Aristotle. Bacon had no problem with attacking Aristotle. So Aristotle was coupled to the Bible. Bacon says Aristotle was wrong, but he didn't say that the Bible was wrong. And while well, he was an important man in English uh, politics, so he could do that without uh, well, being questioned by the Inquisition. And um, he argued against Aristotle, for instance, that we should use experiments and not solely observation to learn about the natural world. He said we needed a new method, and the old method obviously was that of Aristotle. Part of this new method was that we had to abandon our epistemic prejudices. We also need to use the empirical method, which means that we use observation and experiments. So that's contrary, that's clearly contrary to Aristotle. And we need to use induction. Well, there you see that he in some way sides with Aristotle because Aristotle also uses induction but he did do that wrong according to Bacon. So let's take a look at these three elements of his new method. Maybe the most important part is that, at least for psychology students, is that he says we should abandon our prejudices and he's not talking about uh, sexist or racist prejudices but about epistemic prejudices. So he also speaks about idols or false conceptions and they stand in the way of acquiring knowledge. So there are ways of thinking that if you employ these ways of thinking you might end up with the wrong conclusion about the world. So you might think you have knowledge but actually you don't. So we need to be extremely wary not to use these prejudices. Bacon distinguishes four types of epistemic prejudices or false conceptions or idols as he calls them the idols of the tribe of the cave the marketplace and of the theater and these days we would call them biases so clearly he is doing psychology before there is a science uh, called psychology so let's take a look at these four types of idols first there are the idols of the tribe and those even though it seems to be just about the tribe, about a small group of human beings, it is about all human beings. So these are ways of thinking every human being employs. So if we're talking about thinking mistakes, we're talking about making typically human mistakes. 
So for instance, if you see a visual illusion, so you see a steady picture, but it appears to be moving, then you can check it and you can see, well, it's really a picture. Uh, but still, even though you know that it's a picture and you've all seen illusions like that, um, it still seems to be moving. But now you know, because you did some research, well, it is actually a picture, then you know it is a visual illusion. There is no actual movement. An example that he gives is seeing a regularity where there actually is none. So you've seen 10 white swans and then you conclude all swans are white. So basically he's talking about induction. And obviously induction can lead to correct, uh, co correct conclusions, but also to false conclusions. So it is about seeing order and regularity where there is none, thinking that all swans are white. Well, actually, that's not the case. Another example is what we now would call confirmation bias. We search for confirmation and ignore refutations, falsifications of what we believe. Also, we see the sun go down, but obviously the sun doesn't go down. It is the earth moving around its axis that gives us the appearance as if the sun goes down. And another example is that we ignore things where uh, things we think would go right actually went wrong. So sailors, for instance, that were in a storm, they trust in the power of prayer. They pray to God, please get us out of this storm. And well, uh, then later when they uh, get ashore, then they tell, well, we were praying to God and God answered our prayers. So prayer works. So we have these mechanisms and what we tend to ignore them is all those sailors in this example uh, that also pray to God, but perished at sea. So this is the first idol he distinguishes, the idol of the tribe. Then there are the idols of the cave, and these are the idols that we have because we belong to a certain subgroup of human beings, to a certain culture, um, certain age group, uh, whatever. So for instance, there are people that think that everything um, in earlier times was better. So extreme conservatism, and Bacon says, well, that's probably not the case, right? There were things that are way better these days than in the past. But it is also true that there were things in the past that were better than they were now. So uh, an extreme preference for new things, for only new things um, that should also be avoided. So these are idols of the cave. Then are the idols of the marketplace, and these have to do with human beings having a language. So I have, for instance, my mobile phone here. So there is this word phone and it refers to things like that. Uh, phones obviously exist. Uh, if you go to the market, to the marketplace, and uh, you are walking towards it and you hear someone shouting on the market, bananas, 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 you probably think there's someone selling bananas and you, you go there and it would be very disappointing if there were no bananas. So the word bananas obviously also refers to things that are real. But there are words that you might also think refer to something, just like the bananas on the market, and there they do. Uh, or at least when there are bananas on the marketplace, you, uh, you'll find that uh, the word actually refers. But there are things like luck, the element of fire, coincidence, or witch, or élan vital, a life-giving principle. There is no biology book that says and then there is a life-giving principle that makes organisms alive. Just like luck also doesn't exist. If, if we all buy a lottery ticket, then one of us is bound to win the lottery. And um, then someone wins the lottery. And then you say, well, this person had a lottery ticket and a lot of luck. No, you don't need luck. The luck doesn't exist. It's just the distribution of... Uh, the lottery tickets and one person is uh, going to win and uh, this person did not have luck there was not something that you can get somewhere give me a kilogram of luck whatever um, that's impossible so even though we do have words they do not always refer to real things and the mistake we make is that we think that there, if, if there is a word that it refers to something real like which if you mean that it refers to, if you mean by which someone that uh, can fly, put spells on other people and change into animals, then there are no witches. 
if you just mean by which a mean person yes those people do exist and the last idols he distinguishes are the idols of the theater and basically what he's thinking about is about authorities and he's not thinking about scientists right he is thinking about ancient philosophical schools he is thinking about aristotle and the aristotelian schools so he wants to break with aristotle not with the bible so he has his own idol of the theater and that is he believes what's in the in what's in the bible but these are the kind of biases he already distinguishes and says they are part of the new method. Be aware of these idols, be aware of these biases, we should say, because they stand in our way of gathering knowledge, acquiring knowledge. So please be careful with respect to your own thinking, to your own way of jumping to conclusions. Bacon also argued that we should use experiments. He did some themselves so aristotle basically argued we should only use observation and not experiments because then you manipulate the world and if you manipulate the world you learn something only about the manipulated world and not about the natural world bacon says no you learn about the natural world when you do experiments and that's of course is something we adhere to these days as well one of the things he asked himself was whether if you use massive quantities of opium each year just one, once a year, but each year, large doses of opium, that, that would prolong your life, and in all likelihood, that became his death, because he experimented on himself. One other element of his new method is the use of induction. Now, this doesn't sound very new, because Aristotle all, uh, also said that we should use induction. And Bacon says, induction is a mix of perception and understanding. So Bacon has a rationalist element in his epistemology. It's not just about the observation of uh, things in the world and the results of experiments, but also you have to use your understanding, your reason. And there he seems a little bit on a par with Aristotle in that sense that Aristotle also says, well, it's not just observation. You conclude basically to a general law. Um, so good science uses observation, also observation thus of the results of experiments and rational uh, inference. So what is the difference with Aristotle? They both used induction, but Aristotle was wrong according to Bacon because he was too easily satisfied with a general conclusion. So for instance, we looked at the claim that all men are mortal, all human beings are mortal. Socrates sees some people die in Athens and then concludes all human beings are mortal. And I can see that also with my reason that it has to be true. And Bacon says, you don't take the induction problem seriously enough. You need to check whether this general claim also holds in other places like London where Bacon lived. So where Aristotle was easily satisfied by saying that the general claim is true, Bacon keeps on looking for possible refutations of the general claim. So he takes this problem of induction uh, more seriously than Aristotle did. Bacon basically paved the way for others to also think for themselves to reject Aristotle. And then, of course, you'll see that there is again the debate between the skeptic, the rationalist and the empiricist. And we start with looking at the rationalist, René Descartes. Because Bacon broke with Aristotle, but not with the Bible, other philosophers like the rationalist René Descartes were able to think again about where knowledge comes from without reference to uh, Aristotle. So Descartes famously defended a rationalism, but it is a different rationalism than Plato's rationalism was. So he does not accept Plato's theory of the super, supernatural world of forms, the world of ideas, and he also does not accept his theory of anamnesis, so this idea that to learn is actually 
to remember and that you remember the ideas. If you don't accept the world of forms, if you don't accept these forms, these ideas, then obviously you're also not going to accept this way of um, uh, recalling those ideas. So that's, that's important to see that Descartes was a rationalist. We'll see in a moment why he was that, and by that his rationalism is different from Plato's rationalism. Um, but the goal was the same. He wanted certain knowledge. So he asked himself the question, what am I absolutely sure of? That's the question he asks. Are you, for instance, sure that two and two equals four? Are you, for instance, sure that you exist? Are you, uh, are you sure that there is a world, that there are human beings, that there is a place called Amsterdam? Are you sure? Descartes responded to a fellow Frenchman, Michel de Montaigne, who was a skeptic. So we have seen that skeptics say there is no knowledge. Knowledge is impossible. The problem is the justification. You might have beliefs, you might think those beliefs are true, they might actually be true, but you can never know that they are actually true. And what, the way Montaigne argued for that, he says, you can doubt every claim. So I have the claim, let's take my phone again, I have the claim that this is my mobile phone. Now, I have this belief, I think that's true, but can I justify it? I can say, well, I can see it. So that's an argument I could put on a, on a, uh, a balance and I put it on one side in favor of the claim that I have a mobile phone uh, lying here on the table. In favor is of that claim is I can see it. So that's my justification. But on the other hand, I might be in a virtual reality and then the phone doesn't really exist. So that's an argument against my belief that there is a mobile phone on the table, uh, that it's true. And Bacon says, you put them on a scale and the scale is always in balance. You never know which one is the right argument in favor for your claim. And he doesn't want to say, um, I know nothing, because then he says, if I claim that I know nothing, I know something that is that I do know not that I do know uh, nothing. So he phrases it in a question. He says, que sais -je? what do I know? And that's not a knowledge claim. So he had a medal made with on one side, que sais -je? and on the other side, a scale that was in balance. And he says the scale of knowledge is always balanced. And that is the arguments in favor of a certain claim are just as good as the arguments against that claim. So you can never know which one is true. So you can always doubt whether there is actually a phone on the table, whether there is actually a world, whether there is actually a place called Amsterdam. And this is what Descartes responded to. So what Descartes says is, I thought I knew a lot. I have all these beliefs, which I think are true, and which I always thought were actually knowledge, were justified in true beliefs, but maybe I'm wrong. And for instance, he said, well, I learned that Aristotle was always right, and then I found out that Aristotle was wrong. So what people tell me is not always right, even though I thought it was true. So he says, everything that I can doubt, every belief I have that I can doubt, so he uses the method of radical doubt as the method of his, of his opponent, the skeptic of Michel de Montaigne. He uses the first method of radical doubt, and he uses that to see whether there is some belief he has that he cannot doubt and therefore actually has to be true. It, it is actually true. It is knowledge. So he says, everything my teachers told me might be false. I can doubt that. I know for certain, well, I, I know that they, they tell me that Aristotle was right, but I think is, Aristotle is wrong. They didn't lie, but they told falsehoods. They, they really thought that Aristotle was right, but Descartes found out that he wasn't. And he says, so I cannot trust, trust my teachers. But I also cannot trust my own senses because there are all these visual illusions. There is an illusion that if I look uh, at a road, that the end of the road is really small. The sides of the road come together. 
and then I walk along the road and then I'm at this point where I think the sides of the road come together and then I look again and then that's not the case. The road is just as wide as the beginning, but if I turn around, now I look at the beginning of the road and there the sides of the road seem to come together. So my senses, at least in one of these two cases, have deceived me, have told me something that's not true. So I cannot trust my senses. And that means that he rejects empiricism. He says, no, 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 it's not observation using your senses that is the source of knowledge. Everything I, I've learned via my senses cannot be regarded as knowledge. I might think that there is a road, but there might not be a road. Because he says, I can imagine that there is an evil demon, a malin genie, that might be fooling me. And that creates a virtual reality, like, like in the movie The Matrix. I am lying somewhere and I'm kind of dreaming all these things. I'm dreaming that there's a mobile phone, but mobile phones don't really exist. And that's all because there is an evil demon, an all-powerful evil demon, that is fooling me. And this evil demon is even fooling me that there is a physical world. Because I think there is a physical world, but there is no physical world. I'm just a mind that's being fooled by an evil demon. And I'm even fooled in mathematics. So I'm even fooled in thinking that 2 and 2 equals 4. But it isn't for it's nine and three quarters or something like that. I don't know what it is. And Descartes says, I've been wrong in a solution to really difficult mathematical problems. So why couldn't I be wrong in really easy, seemingly easy mathematical problems? I think it's really easy that two and two equals four, but I might be wrong there. And the evil demon might give me the impression, the idea that two and two equals four, but it actually doesn't. And then he says the evil demon might even try to convince me that I, not, um, that I do not exist. So I'm going to doubt my own existence. And then Descartes says, if I doubt my own existence, I have to exist, right? Because who else is doing the doubting? So if I think that I not exist, I have to exist. So there is his first absolute truth, something that he cannot doubt. So he uses this method of radical doubt and the only thing he finds out is that he has to exist every time he thinks i think therefore i am cogito ergo sum one of the most famous slogans in western philosophy so even if there's an evil demon this demon cannot make me think that i do not exist because if i do it if i do think that <laughs> i have to exist so here we have basically his foundation of his new building of knowledge. So he used a radical doubt method to break down his building of what he thought was knowledge, but actually turned not out to be knowledge. So now we have a rationalist foundation. So that's, that's the metaphor he uses. You have a building of knowledge, a building of science if you want, and it has to be founded on a solid foundation. If your foundation is not solid, then the entire building of knowledge will collapse. So you need to find something that you're absolutely 100% certain of that you cannot doubt. And that is, I think, therefore I am. Okay. But that, at that moment in, in his books, when he writes about this, at this moment, he only knows that he thinks and exists. And that's it. He doesn't know that there is a physical world. He doesn't know that there are other human beings. He doesn't know that there's a place called Amsterdam. And he even doesn't know that two and two equals four or whatever it equals two. So he doesn't know that. And now you see that he is indeed a rationalist because he has a rationalist foundation. He's seen not with his senses, but with his mind, with his reason that I think, therefore I am, has to be true. Okay. Then he goes to his second method, and that's really a rationalist method, clearly not an empiricist method, because he asks himself the question, how do I know that I think, therefore I am, is true? And he says, that is something I see clearly and distinctly with my reason. Okay, 
That's a good thing. Because that helps the car to get rid of the evil demon. Because as long as the evil demon, the Malajini, is on stage, if he is, in, he is uh, at work, you cannot even know that 2 and 2 equals 4. You cannot know that, there, that you have a physical body or there are other human beings, because he might deceive you in that. So now he uses his method of the clear and distinct perception, perception with the mind, right, with the reason, to get rid of the malingenie. What he does, it's actually quite clever, though not convincing, he replaces the evil demon with a good demon. And this good demon, obviously, we call God, and Descartes was a good Catholic. Descartes says, I find in myself the idea of God. This idea of God contains that it's a perfect being. How can I, René Descartes, have this idea of absolute, a, a, an absolute perfect being while I am myself not a perfect being? So how do I get this idea of perfection? And he says, he argues that he sees clearly and distinctly that it can only come, come from God. Or another, another proof of the, of the existence is God has to exist because God is perfect, according to this idea, and to exist is more perfect than not to exist. And by the same way, he clearly and distinctly perceives, sees with his mind, that God is good, because if God is perfect, being good is more perfect than being bad. So there is this benign, all-powerful being that is God, and if God exists, so and this is basically, so we, we're not going to debate this, but uh, Descartes basically shows that God exists and that God is good and that therefore, since God would not deceive us like the evil demon did, if you use your ratio properly, then uh, you can see that indeed there is a physical world. If you use your ratio properly, you can find, you can figure out that two and two equals four. Um, there, there are other human beings and that there is a place like Amsterdam where Descartes lived for a, uh, for several years. So that's how we did it. And you can clearly see that he is a rationalist. And then he basically says, okay, I've proved the existence of God. So now I know that God exists, that God is good. And therefore that he doesn't deceive me in thinking that there is a physical world. So there is a physical world. And then he became, and can he, then he can do actual science then he can try to find out about this physical world and about human beings. And then he says, okay, I have all these ideas then, and just like Locke and Berkeley and Hume, he classifies those ideas, and he classifies them, in this case, by how we got them. And he says some ideas, like the idea of God, those ideas are innate, so you're born with them. So here it's clear that he is different from Plato, because Plato says, all ideas are innate. And Descartes just says, some ideas are innate, and other ideas are acquired by doing, well, empirical research. By using observation, doing experiments, Descartes did also, also did experiments. But he says, you have always to check what you observe with your ratio, because otherwise you might think that the sun is this big because well if i look at it well yeah the sun is this big so but if you understand that the sun is really far away then you know that the sun really has to be big and you see this also with your reason so you have acquired ideas and that doesn't make an empiricist because all these ideas are checked by his reason and then there are invented ideas basically um ideas of the imagination you have seen a horse you've seen a bird you put the the, the, the wings of the bird in your mind together with the horse, and then you have a flying horse like Pegasus. Okay, that's not really knowledge, of course, but uh, there is all kinds of knowledge possible, and this knowledge, for a large part, has been acquired by using your senses, by doing research in the world, and checking them to your reason, but it's clear that it's not this process of anamnesis, of recollection, that we found in an earlier rationalist, Plato. 
So putting aside whether the, um, the proof of the existence of God really works, you probably think, like I do, that it doesn't, you can see that Descartes is really optimistic because he uses the method of doubt of his opponent, the skeptic. Then he gets rid of all his former beliefs, and it turns out that the only thing he really knows is that he has to exist. How does he know that? He sees that clearly and distinctly. Then he uses that rationalist method, this is his second method, to basically build his theory of knowledge. And the first thing he has to do is to get rid of the evil demon, and he does that by replacing it with the good God. God doesn't deceive us, and then you can do research and you can do um, and you can build up this uh, epistemological uh, building of uh, knowledge, right? Um, so he's really optimistic about being able to have real knowledge about having real knowledge about the physical world and also about the mental world. He's one of the very first philosophers or scientists that wrote about uh, mental disorders. After Descartes, there came Newton. And they are often mentioned in one way because Descartes looked at the world as a great machine. And Newton did that as well. And because Newton looked at the physical world as a giant clock, basically, a big machine, big mechanism, he found out all these physical laws. And these physical laws, these natural laws, uh, describing the movement of objects, worked really well. That's, that's one of the reasons, of course, why uh, Newton became so famous. He had found out all these laws, and these laws, when you predict them to make predictions about movement of physical objects, they work. At least in those times, they worked for the distances we are uh, usually uh, concerned with as human beings uh, living on planet Earth. It only goes wrong at really, really small distances or really large distances. So Descartes and Newton were very optimistic about gaining knowledge and others obviously also were very optimistic. Newton was really famous. His uh, physics really worked, uh, worked really well to make all these predictions. Um, so in those days, people were really optimistic about the ability to acquire true knowledge about the world. Basically, Descartes gave us a foundation and, they, and, and Newton uh, actually did a scientific work. Descartes also did do that, but most of what he found out uh, actually was later falsified. Uh, and it seems at that moment that the skeptic is defeated. But that only seems to be the case. Descartes thus thought that he could actually acquire Justify the true beliefs, knowledge, but if you reject his proof of the existence of God, then you land up with skepticism. The question is, of course, then whether the empiricist, the contemporary uh, empiricist of uh, Descartes, whether that they did it any better. Let's look at these empiricists in chronological order, starting with the empiricism of John Locke. There are several important aspects to Locke's epistemology. He rejects inborn ideas. He's a real empiricist, so he doesn't accept inborn ideas. We have to take a look at that. Then he formulates the empiricist principle. That is, of course, about knowledge. Knowledge in these days were called ideas. Uh, so he acquires knowledge, he acquires ideas. So we have to take a look at ideas because there is a problem with his classification of ideas. And what is also important uh, in his epistemology is the difference between ideas and qualities. Locke wants to defend empiricism. He has read Descartes' work and we just saw Descartes claims that there are innate ideas and in the first lecture we saw that the associated claim of the rationalist is that in some way rationalists accept that there are innate ideas, that there is innate knowledge, something like that. Empiricism cannot accept that. 
So Locke, when he starts writing about epistemology, he starts by refuting the innate ideas that are being distinguished by René Descartes and the Cartesian, because Cartesian, uh, Locke came from uh, England and there were many Cartesians in England. So he starts by looking at Descartes and the Cartesians and he says, what are the innate ideas that I find in the work of Descartes, but also in the work of the Cartesians? For instance, there are the following innate ideas, alleged innate ideas. That what is, is. It is impossible to be and not to be at the same time. And all kinds of moral principles. Okay, we find that as a kind of self-evident innate ideas that you find in all human beings according to the rationalists. Locke disagrees. He says how do the rationalists argue in favor for their claim? And basically the argument is these ideas like that what is is are found in all human beings and the explanation of why all human beings know that that what is is that it is impossible to be and not to be at the same time and that we all have the same moral principles the explanation for that is that we are born with it and Locke says well how do you know that just ask a small child is it true that what is is well a little baby a, that, is, that has just been born will not be able to answer that question because it doesn't have language. So in acquiring, acquiring language, a child or a person, I should say, could also have acquired the knowledge that that what is, is, or that it's impossible to be and not to be at the same time, and could also have acquired all kinds of moral principles. So first of all, universal principles principles, ideas that we find in all human beings can also be explained in an empiricist way, in a way that you're not born with it, but you have acquired them. So that's the first point he makes. And secondly, he says, these principles you distinguish as being, you, you classify as being innate, are supposed to be universal, but they aren't. So when a child has acquired language, ask it, is it true that what is is? Ask this to for a, ch a child of four years old or six year old, six years old, the child will not understand what you're saying. So, children, fools, do not have these universal principles. And also, look look at look around you in the world. Not everybody has the same moral principles. That's clearly false. The idea that we all have the same moral principles clearly is false. This means that Locke can start developing his empiricism. So he has damaged pretty, pretty severely rationalism by discussing these innate ideas and showing that, well, the, the ideas that the rationalists claim that are innate aren't innate at all. So now he develops his empiricism. How then do we get a knowledge according to Locke? Well, Locke is very clear. He says, whence has it is all the materials of reason and knowledge? Well, where do, 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 do our ideas come from? To this I answer in one word, from experience. So that is, you look into the world, you experience all kinds of things, and that is the source of knowledge. So Locke clearly is an empiricist. Earlier we saw Aristotle, and he is always classified as an empiricist, but he actually wasn't. He, didn't, he has never said of himself that he was an empiricist. Here we find this principle by John Locke. This is his formulation of his empiricist principle, in that all knowledge is founded, and, and from that it ultimately, ultimately derives itself. Okay, it all stems from experience. And we have these experiences by using our senses. Okay, he is really clear about this. What is experience according to Locke? Well, that's perception, the observation. Um, so 
I, I, I see the, this, this box and it has a certain color. Yes, look, look at uh, the curtains, they have a certain color. So I experience red or blue or whatever. And that's part of my perception, but also my reflection. So you could call that internal perception or introspection if you want. So if you look inside your mind, you can see thoughts, for instance, and that's how you get the idea of a thought. You don't see them with your eyes or you don't taste thoughts or something like that. So it's not with our usual senses that we can have knowledge about the workings of our minds, but we have some inner kind of eye, some inner perception. So reflection, he calls that. And that is the source of knowledge about what's going on in our minds. Now, all these philosophers, Descartes, Locke, and Berkeley and Hume, we'll look at them in a moment, they classify the ideas. So knowledge consists of ideas, and what Locke says, we have simple ideas and complex ideas. Simple ideas are uh, the idea like yellow. You can't say that it is, uh, it consists of two or more ideas. It's just one thing, it's yellow, and that's it. You can't say, well, yellow consists of, well, A and B, well, what would A and B be? But if I, I let's take a look at the phone again. Well, the phone, a mobile phone, well, it consists of a shape and the use of it and all the things you can do with it. So it's really complex ideas. All kinds of ideas come together in this idea of a mobile phone. Now, so far so good because I can see colors, I can see shapes, I can see what go on, goes on, on on a mobile phone. So I can have all these perceptions and I can uh, infer from that, I can uh, get, acquire knowledge uh, about it from that perception. But in his classification of ideas, Locke also says that he has the idea of a substance. And that's a bit of a strange um, notion, but it's a classical philosophical notion. A substance basically is that which underlies something and it has all kinds of properties. So if I look at my phone, that's a physical object. It has a color, it has a, a, a picture on it. Uh, it's, it's smooth, it's kind of hard. Uh, so it has all these properties and basically there's all properties of a physical thing. And this physical thing is the substance. It's a physical substance and it can exist on its own. Descartes would say a substance is that which can exist on its own and you have the physical substance and the mental substance. But the problem for an empiricist would be, okay, if I look at my phone, I can see the picture, I can feel that it's smooth, I can knock on it and can hear and also feel that it's kind of hard. I can see the shape, I can see the color. But where is the substance? Where do you perceive the substance? Where is it? And that's a problem. And if you look at Locke's work, every time he's talk, he talks about this idea of a substance, because he says he has this idea of a substance, then you might think that he will be critical about that and ask himself the question, how do I know that there is a substance? Basically, if you say that there is a physical substance that you cannot perceive, but what you perceive are all the properties of the substance, I can observe the, the color, the shape, the hardness, etc. I can observe those, but not the substance. Then as an empiricist, I cannot have knowledge about a substance. And that's a problem for Locke. So that's, that's, that's a big problem for Locke. If you accept ideas of something you cannot observe, you cannot experience. So that's a big problem. Okay, so that's one thing. And this, this is why Locke's um, uh, empiricism, at least with respect to this idea, doesn't work. There's an interesting thing he does. He says, I can make a distinction between ideas and qualities. So what are qualities? Basically, um, we perceive all kinds of qualities and they leave an idea in us. So the phone has a certain shape. That's a quality. 
that's a property. So quality is just a different word for property. And light falls on it and it reflects and it stimulates our eyes, and etc. Uh, and then we see the phone, we see the, sh the shape in this case, and that leaves an idea. In us. So there's a distinction between the quality, the property, and the ID we have of the property of the quality. And now he says, and that's what makes it interesting, there are primary qualities and secondary properties. And primary qualities are properties that can exist on their own. They are independent of any perceiver, independent of any observer. So I observe the rectangular shape of my phone, but if I don't observe it, it's still rectangular, right? That's a primary property. But he also distinguish, distinguishes secondary properties, secondary qualities. And those are qualities that exist because there is an observer observing some primary properties of an object. So take a bottle or a bucket of water. This water has a certain temperature. You can measure that. So if you measure it, if you measure it, I measure it, if you have a proper uh, uh, device, then we all get to the same answer. For instance, that it's 18 degrees Celsius. That's the primary quality. Now, if you put your hand into a bucket of water, would you be able to tell that it's 18 degrees Celsius? Probably not. You can guess that it's somewhere between, say, 10 and 20 degrees Celsius. It's not, you're not burning your hand, it's not freezing. So it has to be some temperature that is, say, around 18 degrees Celsius, but you cannot really measure it. But you can feel whether it's cold or whether it's lukewarm or whether it's hot. But, and then we say that, we say, oh, that water is hot. So for, for instance, on a, on a winter's day, if you've been out um, um, shopping without gloves or, or something, and then you get home and you have a bucket of water that's 80 degrees Celsius, you put your hands in it, that is really warm. And then you say, oh, this is really nice warm water. But on a summer's day, when you've been outside in the sun, then you get inside and then you have a bucket of water that's 18 degrees Celsius, you put your hands in it, and then you say, oh, this is really nice cold water. So whether the, the water is cold or warm, that depends on the perceiver, depends on the observer. And 18 degrees Celsius in one situation could be experienced as cold and in another as warm. So if you then ascribe the property of being cold to the water, that is what is called a secondary quality. It depends on you. It's not the property of the water itself. The water itself is just 80 degrees Celsius. That's the primary quality. If we perceive 80 degrees Celsius, we usually are not able to tell what the exact temperature is, but we are able to tell whether it's cold or warm, but the water actually isn't warm or cold. That depends on you. So, the shape of my phone, for instance, is a primary quality. It exists independent of an observer. Whether something is warm or cold depends on an observer and therefore is a secondary quality. Now, one big question students usually immediately ask when uh, I explain John Locke is, aren't the primary qualities not just as illusory as the secondary qualities? In other words, are the primary qualities also not dependent on the observer? So are the primary qualities not also secondary qualities? That is the view of the second British empiricist, George Berkeley. Berkeley argues that all properties or all qualities of the physical world are secondary properties. That thus means that every property that we think exists in the physical world is actually something we perceive in that way. So usually we might think that the water is cold, that the water has an objective property of being cold. And then Locke says, no, 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 no. It has the objective primary property of being 18 degrees Celsius. 
and we ascribe to that on a summer's day the property of being cold but on a winter's day we would ascribe to it the property of being warm so those those properties being warm being cold do not really exist out there in the world but are basically describing the way we perceive it and then we ascribe this uh, property to in this case the water but Locke said whether you perceive it or not the shape of the mobile phone he didn't have mobile phones but the shape of this object is rectangular that that does not depend on the observer that is a primary property that's independent of a perceiver that's independent of an observer Berkeley says to be is to be perceived to be rectangular is also dependent on an observer and that means that all the physical properties of the world depend on an observer all the physical properties of the world are secondary properties take for example height that's the example he gives he says if you take a pebble a small rock then this is indeed a small rock for a human being but it's huge for an ant so whether it's tall or small or it's high or whether it's a really tiny object that depends on the observer but height according to Locke and also Descartes and uh, and Galileo and Robert Boyle that would be a property a property that is a primary property that's independent of an observer and now Berkeley argues no 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 for an end something can be tall which is small for a human being so height is also dependent on an observer on a perceiver to be to be warm is to be perceived as warm to be high is to be perceived as high to be small is to be perceived as small all the physical properties in the world depend on an observer so we perceive things so that's still empiricism because we know about the pebble we know about the water by experience in it so perception is still key knowledge stems still from experience so it's still empiricism but if the physical world only exists when it's being perceived that's kind of odd right because what happens when you close your eyes well it's not a denial of physical reality it's not that the physical world disappears um, but it depends on being observed and that means that if I do not lo look the world does not disappear the world's still there so put something in your fridge you have a party you buy some beer you put it in the fridge you close the fridge no one is looking at the beer hmm if Berkeley is right if no one's observing the beer then all the properties of the cans of beer disappear the beer disappears you open the fridge lo and behold luckily the beer is still there how can that be well you're mis you were mistaken that it was not being observed so it had to be observed all the time and well which what or who is the all observing powerful being of course that's God again so for Berkeley he first starts by arguing that all the primary properties of the physical world are actually secondary properties then he notices this problem of the physical world disappearing if we're not looking but the world doesn't disappear when we're not look when we're not looking and thus there has to be something that's looking at everything all the time God is watching everything always and that's his proof of the existence of God Berkeley was a bishop now this is problematic right His view is called idealism because basically everything depends on the mind, on the ideas we have. So the view that reality is essentially mental. It's not a denial of the physical world, but the physical world be depends on our mental world. And the problem with Berkeley is that he didn't reason properly. Because if you say that a pebble is small for a human being and tall for an ant, 
that might be true and then tall and small are indeed secondary properties but that doesn't make height a secondary property because you can measure the height in say two centimeters and just like with the 18 degrees celsius being a primary property of water which you can experience depending on whether it's summer or winter as cold or as hot depending on the observer something that has the primary property of being two centimeters in height can be observed can be perceived as tall or as small but that doesn't make the height a secondary property so berkeley didn't reason properly and the reasoning is with respect to claiming reasoning that all primary primary properties are actually secondary properties. So the problem is not in the proof of God, because if you don't buy the idea that all primary properties are actually secondary properties, there is no problem of the disappearing world, because then you say, well, there are physical worlds, physical objects in the physical world, like my mobile phone, like the bucket of water, if I don't, and like the beer in the fridge, and if I don't look, well, it's still there, because the physical world is independent of the mental world. It's only that, that it becomes a problem if you say that the physical world depends for its existence to be, is to be perceived, to exist is to be perceived, that it, for its existence, it depends on the mind. So this is from the three, three versions of empiricism, Locke, Berkeley's and Hume's. This is the one that really uh, doesn't make sense to most people. But the one of Hume does, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. Hume's empiricism is uh, probably the most honest one of the three of Locke's, Berkeley's, and Hume's empiricism. Locke having this problem of substance and Berkeley arguing kind of uh, awkwardly for primary properties being secondary properties. Can't imagine that. That he didn't see himself that that was an, not, a, not a, a good way of reasoning and Hume tried to defend empiricism but we'll see that in the end he fails in doing so at least in some sense just like Locke Hume argues that if you look at the world if you perceive the world we acquire knowledge he also formulates an empiricist principle in this case this is called the copy principle. What he says is we look at the world, we get all kinds of impressions and these impressions in our minds leave behind ideas when they are gone. So basically I look at, I stand on top of a mountain, I look at a city, I get an impression of the city, I close my eyes and then I have an idea left of the city. And he also says, well, this idea of the city is fainter than the actual observation, the actual uh, sensory experience we have. So it's like a signet ring that leaves a, uh, an imprint in wax. So you have a ring with a uh, form on it, put it into the wax, get rid of the ring, and then there's the stamp into this imprint in the wax. And normally this nicely corresponds with each other the imprint, the form, the idea in the mind corresponds to the uh, object, uh, the drawing on, uh, on the ring. So if I stand on top of Arthur's seat, mountain near Edinburgh, I look over Edinburgh, Hume was a Scottish philosopher who lives in Edinburgh, if you stand on top of this mountain, you look at it, then you close your eyes, then there is a correspondence between the idea of Edinburgh and, if you open your eyes again, the impression of Edinburgh. So there is a nice correspondence between the two, normally. He also makes a distinction between simple and complex ideas. So simple ideas being ideas you cannot distinguish parts of and complex ideas consisting of parts. So Let's look at the complex idea, for instance. You stand on top of Arthur's seat, this mountain near Edinburgh. You look at Edinburgh, you get an impression of the city of Edinburgh. 
the experience of the city, then you close your eyes or you remember it once, once you are uh, somewhere else, when you think of the city. That's a complex idea, of course, because there are movement is involved, shape is involved, all kinds of colors. And if you look only at the experience of white, if you look at snow, for instance, you have just the experience of white or a white piece of paper really close to your, to your face. Then you experience white. Um, and you can't distinguish any elements from that. So then you have a simple impression and a simple idea. So far, so good. Now, there are also complex ideas of cities that actually do not exist, like the city of New Jerusalem. How can I have this idea of New Jerusalem, where uh, the cities, uh, the, 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 the roofs are made of gold and the roads are paved with diamonds? You haven't seen that because it doesn't exist. Well, but it consists, this idea of, this complex idea of New Jerusalem consists of all kinds of simple ideas that you can trace back to things you actually have seen, to impressions, to simple ideas that were the result of those impressions. So you have seen gold, you have seen diamonds, and then you combine them together with this complex of idea of a city, and then you can get to the complex idea of New Jerusalem. Okay, so that's the, just the workings of the mind, and then you, we can combine simple ideas basically into new complex ideas. So that's not a real problem for Hume, but there is a uh, serious problem. So, for which there is no solution. In this case, reduce the complex idea to the simple ideas that correspond to previous experiences. That's the solution here. But there is a really big problem for Hume that he cannot solve. Hume says, okay, I'm an empiricist. He formulates this copy principle. We can only gain ideas from experience, from the impressions we get. Okay, he clearly is an empiricist. He says so himself. And then he says, when we think about the world, we always use the concept of causality. So when we think about the matters of fact, the world, the world consists of the matters of fact. So for instance, the spark caused the explosion, the lack of dopamine induced uh, Parkinson's disease, the crisis caused unemployment. But also if I say, how, how is it, that, that, that I am able um, uh, to see my hand. Well, there's light falling on it. This light, light reflects on the surface of my hand. That's a causal relationship. It stimulates the retina. That's a causal relationship. The, the cones and rods in the retina start firing to the back of your head. That's a causal relationship. We, for every event in the world that we can know something about, we need this concept of causality. It's always implicitly or explicitly involved in our ideas about the world. We'll discuss this also in uh, the tutorials. In, this is for the first tutorial, and it's also in one of the um, additional knowledge clips that is part of the alternatives to the tutorials for those that cannot or will not come to campus. Hume says, okay, if we can have knowledge about the matters of fact, only if we can have knowledge about causality, because that's what he says. He says, we think about the world, we use the term causality, we use this idea of causality, then we should be justified in using that concept. And if we are not justified in using the notion of causality, if we cannot have knowledge about causal relationships, then we cannot have knowledge about anything at all. And then skepticism follows. Now he says, okay, let's take a look at what we mean by causality. And he says there are three elements. When do we say that A is the cause of B? We say that A is the cause of B if A occurs prior to B. If it's the other way around, then we don't say that it's the cause of B. So basically he says, the, his, his example is the collision of two billiard balls. Billiard ball one and billiard ball two collide. So there's first a collision, event A, and then billiard ball two rolls away. That's the effect. That's event B. So 
first we need a collision and then the rolling away of the second billiard ball is first the second billiard ball rolls away and then the first collides with it we don't say that that collision was the cause of the rolling of the second billiard ball prior to the collision so there is priority okay you we can observe that you can see there's first a collision and then there is uh, the rolling away of the second billiard ball so priority is an element of causality and we can observe that so a, an empiricist can have knowledge about that then there is contiguity with a g not an n so it's not continuity but it's contiguity of events a and b that means that they are located near each other in time and space so again the example of the collision and rolling away of the second billiard ball if we say that the collision event a is the cause of the rolling away of billiard ball event b then the collision has to take place very near the movement of the second billiard ball so if there is a collision here and in amsterdam a billiard ball start rolling that's not near enough so that that is not near each other in space and also if two billiard balls collide here and then after an hour the second one rolls away and it's not near enough in time so it has to be here and now basically where there's event a here and now there's also event b so contiguity is the second element of causality that also can be perceived you can you can perceive that there's a collision here and very near the collision in time and space there is the rolling away of the second billiard ball so we can observe that as well so an empiricist can have knowledge about that now if you only had those two elements then we had then we would have the following problem if you look at a fly landing on a tall building and then the tall building collapses then the landing of the fly is event a which is prior to event B and which is also near time and space uh, to, uh, to, to event B but do we now say that the, the landing of a fly on a tall building made the tall building collapse now there probably was a different um, cause and then it was a coincidence that these two events happened according to priority and contiguity so it was a coincidence so when do we say that event a is the cause of event b when it's not a coincidence but when it's a necessary relation that if event a ha happens b will also happens and this you cannot perceive have you ever seen a necessary relation between two events and hume says i haven't so if this is what we mean by causality then we can have knowledge about priority of two events of one event prior to the other we can have knowledge about contiguity event a takes place in time and space near event b but we cannot observe necessity so an empiricist cannot have knowledge about necessity and therefore not about causality and therefore not about the world that is about the matters of fact and then skepticism follows and Hume doesn't want that he wants to be an empiricist so can he save knowledge of causal relations and this is also I think here I think it, it is also relevant for psychology so he says we cannot perceive necessity and thus empiricists are not justified in using the idea of causality which we use this in our reasoning about the world that's what we do we use the term causality all day long every time this causes that the, the, the spark causes the explosion uh, stuff like that and he says it is our psychology it's the same as for Bacon there was no science called psychology but he basically says our human mind works in a way that when we perceive a constant conjunction of event A and event B then we and, and events A and B satisfy the, the, the elements of priority and contiguity then we 
immediately infer that this is a causal relation. So if you see billiard ball A and B, one and two, collide time and time again, and then time and time again, the second one rolls away, then you have a constant conjunction. Constant means all the time. So you go to a bar, you watch a game, a game of billiards, and every time constant, when there are two billiard balls collide, the second one rolls away. And that is event A is in a constant conjunction going together with event B, collision goes time and time again uh, in conjunction uh, together with event B, the rolling away of the second billiard ball. Then you say, well, I've, I've seen that the entire evening, so that is the constant conjunction is something that is perceptible, you can perceive that. Then we are psychologically inclined to infer causality. Then we say, well, then the next time it probably, well, not probably, it will also happen. And then Hume says this attempt to save knowledge of causality fails because this is an inductive reasoning. We have seen this earlier. Induction is an invalid way of reasoning. The conclusion does not follow logically um, from the premises. If all swans are, if, 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 if ten swans are white, it doesn't mean all swans are white. If in an entire evening, two billiard balls collide and the second one then rolls away. That doesn't mean that every time two billiard balls collide, the second one will roll away, even though it might be true. The truth of that conclusion is not entailed by the truth of the premises, by the assumptions you make based on your uh, observations. So, now we seem to have a psychological mechanism that says if we that, that works in a way that if we observe two events a and b where a is prior to b and a is near time and space to b and it happens the entire evening or your entire life or well not your entire life but a lot and you have seen that then our psychological mechanism is such that we conclude to causality but since that is using induction this is not a valid conclusion and therefore we cannot know that there is an actual causal relation involved we cannot have knowledge of causal relations hume knows this himself we do not have justified and true beliefs about causality and that means that we cannot have knowledge about causal relations and if we need the causal relation to have knowledge about the matters of fact about everything in the world then we cannot know anything about the world not with certainty. And that is basically skepticism. So Hume started off as an empiricist, and you could argue that he ended as a skeptic. So let's briefly summarize what we've seen today and evaluate modern rationalism and empiricism. After Bacon broke with Aristotle, but not with the Bible, it was possible for philosophers to think about knowledge again. And then you see that we have the same debate over again, starting with skepticism, response from rationalists and a response from empiricists. And it doesn't seem to work, right? So Descartes has this problem of this innate ideas. Locke shows that those innate ideas can't be right. Also, we have seen that uh, he uh, he needs the proof for the existence of God, and I think that most of you will get back to that in a later lecture uh, on uh, when we talk about purse. Um, but most of you probably will not buy the um, the argument for the existence of the proof for the existence of God. And then Descartes also doesn't get any further than I think, therefore I am, and that's it. So then it seems that Descartes ends up with skepticism even though he didn't uh, think of that himself um, the empiricists have all kinds of ideas that we cannot accept berkeley doesn't reason properly and if you reason properly and you are an empiricist then you'll end up as hume saying we cannot have knowledge about causality therefore not about world and therefore skepticism follows But what about the Newtonian laws? 
because in these times Newton lived, found out about these laws of physics, and they worked really well in predicting all kinds of movement and other stuff with respect to the natural world. But if the empiricist is right, then we cannot have knowledge about it because all these laws of Newton involve causality and we can't have knowledge about causality. So we can't have knowledge that these laws of physics that Newton discovered apply to reality. We cannot be sure that the laws of nature are true. So what about it? Next time, we'll take a look at someone who says, well, rationalism and empiricism both have their problems. Maybe we could solve these problems and justify knowledge by combining rationalism and empiricism. Since rationalism and empiricism are both problematic, there is another option, and that's the option we'll look at um, next time. That's the option that Immanuel Kant explores, and that is to try to make a synthesis, a combination of empiricism and rationalism, and then we can try to see if we can solve knowledge, knowledge of causality uh, from the claws of the skeptic. Right, let's discuss a question that you can expect about this lecture on an exam. This one is about René Descartes. René Descartes was looking for true knowledge and therefore performed this experiment of radical doubt. What was the foundation of his thinking? Does this foundation making, make him an empiricist or a rationalist? Well, very easy question. It is, uh, I think, therefore I am. We've seen that. So we're looking for that. And he was a rationalist. So we're looking for something that says that. And basically that's answer B. You cannot be mistaken about the fact that you exist. I think therefore I am. That makes him a rationalist because he sees this, not with his senses, but with his mind, with his reason. If you look at A, you cannot go wrong in your own experience. Yes, you can. <laughs> According to Descartes, you experience the road as uh, as the side of the road is coming together in the end and they don't so your experiences your senses can deceive you so a is wrong c uh, you cannot be mistaken about the fact that two plus two equals four yes you can if the evil demon deceives you in thinking that two and two equals four while it's not so he may he, 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 that is a possibility according to Descartes um and D, you cannot be mistaken about the experience that you exist, making him an empiricist. No, it's not about the experience that you exist. It's about the rational insight that you exist. So D is also incorrect. That's it for lecture two. Stay safe.